This is a 16 gig SSD I got off eBay for under $11 shipped. And I've been looking into these, I can't find any actual specific data, any benchmarks, anything, so I guess that's what I'll do now. Um, from everything I've seen, these are actually from Chromebooks. Not much else you can tell about them. Um, apparently they're from the Acer Chromebooks, you can buy them pre-formatted, but I found this guy cheaper, no info about it, just said it works, so we're gonna try how it works. Now, the other thing is applications, and a 16 gig SSD, kind of, the reason it's so cheap is because not a ton of applications for it. You can install Linux on it, and that's probably why they're using them in Chromebooks, so you can shove Chrome OS on it easily. It's too small for Windows OS 10. Um, so, what are some other uses of a small, relatively fast drive? We'll find out how fast it is in a bit. You could use it as a cache. Depending on how fast it is, we'll look at that. We'll see with Windows caching, there's some free caching software we can play with. Um, ZFS cache? I guess I'll try using it as like a ZIL for a little bit to see how that goes. Um, you can, in Linux, B cache might play with that. Um, you could use it as an individual drive. How useful that is, I think, heavily domains. You could use it as a swap drive, maybe. That's another use for it. There's a few uses, it's, but the performance makes a big difference here, because for a bit more, roughly $35 to $40, you can get an Optane drive, which is the same capacity, but has much better write endurance. No idea what the write endurance is, I might just try to kill it for fun, see how much writes I can put on it. And for a bit more, roughly $50, bucks, you can get a 128 gig, which you can actually just put the full OS on. So let's look at a little bit more of what it's like in Windows. And looking at the actual drive itself, on the back we see um, an empty flash package, which can either be um, BGA here, or it can be the side mounted ones to allow for probably whatever flash is cheapest at the time. See a bit of power regulation, probably because these chips wanted a good amount lower voltage in the 3.3 they're getting. M.2 BNM, I think it's a SATA drive. You see more power regulation and other just components, passive components. Under right here is the um, controller chip, and under here is the um, is the flash chip. So for the first batch of testing, I'm sitting in Ubuntu now, booted off another drive. If I run LSBLK, we can see SDA is my boot drive. SDB is the 16 gig drive. And so one thing I like doing on new drives as well is checking the smart data. This is data that's reported by the drive about the actual drive. And you can see quite a bit of info, so you can see, for example, device model, serial number, all the different user capacity, the sector size, form factor, that's wrong, it says it's 2.5, it's an M.2. Uh, SATA version, so to show you your current link speed, which is 6 gigabit, even though it never reaches that speed. It tells you about smart data, so basic data info, it'll show you some data about um, recent tests it's ran on itself. I then show you all these values in here, of which you can find a lot more info on online. The big ones generally to keep track of is reallocated sector count and re um, reallocated event and current pending sector count. Um, current pending sector is really high for some reason. It had got to be an error. Um, you got total amounts with LBAs written in red. LBA is logical block address, so it's basically a sector. One easy way to look at it is I've copied it and pasted it into a sector. Make sure you select the correct size. If I do a calculate, it'll show me that I've written, this must be wrong, um, 0.17 gigs, because I know I've written more than that during testing. So I'm just going to assume this data here is wrong. And it's throwing some errors, a lot of unknown attributes. So yeah, there's a lot of unknown attributes on this drive. And really, is it from what I see an easy way to know if it has any issues going to fail? Doesn't show any errors here right now, but it, th this smart gate is definitely wrong. There's definitely some errors here. Um, pending sector count can't be that high. I think that sector count is more than the amount of sectors it has, or it's just a number of them. Um, the amount written in red has not updated since I started testing this drive, and I've never written at least probably 50 gigs of data on it. Ton of just unknown attributes with no documentation. Apparently 170, at least according to Wikipedia, is like um, the available reserve space. I don't know what that's in. If it's in megabytes, it's not gigabytes. Probably not LBAs. I doubt they have that few empty sectors. So it's not great on this drive, but it does tell you it hasn't failed. The one other interesting attribute is power on hours. Power cycle counts 1100. Power on hours 130. So this drive is basically new. And it shows up as 15 gigabytes. 
And whoa, there's a lot of partitions on it. I made an image of it. It's probably Chrome OS, but we can go hunt more into it now. If we go use less to look at it, we can look through all the data. We could see um, a few things. We could see it's installed via EFI, which would have to be because of the number of partitions and a ton of empty space. Looking at it more, we can find a bit, find a bit more of system information and stuff. So eh, let's have some fun. Let's actually try to boot off of this now and see if it would just happen to be nice enough to let me boot from the Chrome OS system. I don't know, maybe. So now if I do nothing and just boot from the other drive, I get this booting verified image A. The system isn't completely hung because numlock works. I'm guessing something crashed or something control delete isn't doing anything. It's not responding at all. So we're gonna do a hard reset. And here are the benchmark results comparing the SSD to a few other drives I had laying around. So on the left, we have the SSD in a USB enclosure. Next, we have the SSD connected to the SATA controller. Next, we have an older 120 gig SAN disk drive. And then the next, we have a WD1 terabyte hard drive. Looking for in blue for sequential read speeds, we notice we get about 240, 250 on the Kingston drives. About 500 some on the SAN disk, which is quite a bit better, probably due to the limited NAND channels. Maybe if they also utilized the back on that drive, they could get significantly better speeds as well. But they chose not to. We look at the write speeds as well. This is where this drive significantly suffers in se sequential writes. It does very poorly. Um, the SAN disk does quite a bit better, and the hard drive is at about 110 for both speeds. Now, that is a slower hard drive, and there are much faster hard drives. Looking at the random read-write performance, it's quite good, quite a bit better than the other SanDisk drive. I'd love to do a comparison of this drive to something like a Optane or a modern high-end drive like a 960 EVO or Pro. Random reads are quite good, especially compared to the other SanDisk, which I don't know how much it's decaying or just being an older drive. Same with random writes being quite good, which is what I think would make this drive work quite well as a caching drive. Now let's look at using this drive as a cache in Windows. I'm going to try out using Primo Cache and Ready Boost in Windows. Primo Cache costs money. I think Verizon it's 20, 30 bucks for a basic version. Um, I'm mean, looking at a few different benchmarks. First one's Crystal Disk Mark to see how much it helps there. But it's pretty boring. This hard drive is a slow one. And the next test is the standard reboot test. So now. So here's the comparison of the boot up times of the different drives where you can see I did get it installed on the 16 gig drive alone and more on that in a little bit and it's definitely the fastest by quite a bit I think it's about twice as fast as all the different ones um, one thing to note is that boot up time does change a good amount between runs and how much it's doing and how many services needs to be stopped and stuff um, Windows has a kind of a quick boot which uses hibernation type technologies to make it boot faster but that is disabled in a reboot that we do see here we also are counting in the BIOS time, which makes it a reasonable amount longer than a PO just in boot up would be. SSD is already done, everything else is currently loading. Um, the other thing to note for a lot of the changes in time for caching is that it takes some time for that driver to get loaded because it's done all at a software level. Intel's Optane RST does work a slightly bit differently. I don't know exactly what level it's doing it, but if they're using a some hardware acceleration they can have it load a good amount faster so it won't have to load kernel drives for it to initially go. Ready Boost ends up taking the most amount of time could be just run to run variants or it could just be Ready Boost it takes extra time to actually just get it loaded and causes it to actually be slower. What we're going to look at is using Ready Boost in Windows. Now, this is not known for being good. This is the drive, the little SSD shows up as 15 t uh, gigabytes. Um, it should be up ready boost right here. We're gonna say dedicate this device to ready boot. Apply. It's configuring it. Now it's completely full with a ready boost cache file. And if we look at it, the D drive here is my ready boost drive or the SSD. And it's writing data to it right now. And it's reading data from this guy. So I'm assuming it's currently working on building up the cache. So I'm going to let it sit here and work for a minute or two and build up its cache because a cache does take some time before it becomes effective. And here's the result with Ready Boost enabled. We notice random read speeds are a reasonable amount faster. Um, writes are about the same, I'm guessing you're using as a read cache only, which would make sense. So here are the results of Ready Boost. Sequential reads are the same. Sequential writes are better, but I don't think that's due to it. I think it was just a bug on the first test. I didn't run it a few times though. 
see, um, random reads are quite a bit better with ready boost. Random writes are the same. I'm guessing using it as a read cache only now. The next thing I'm gonna try is doing a couple of reboot um, reruns. So we're gonna restart it a couple of times and hope the cache does it. Now the one thing to note with a caching solution and reboot times is that um, you don't know when the actual caching program gets loaded and how early in the process because at least the initial bootload is going off to that but when does it actually decide to start loading the caching program and a lot of the boot time improvements is determined by when it actually loads that program and if we look at the system I'd have to boot up with ReadyBoost at least on the first time there's basically no reads going on on this drive they're very minimal so let's run it a couple more times so that's the end of the ready boost testing. So now we're gonna go and move this ready boost drive, and we're gonna try using a Prima Cache, as it's called, which is a third-party caching solution. I think they have one specifically for Ryzen, which was what, 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 what error showing ready boost info. I can't disable it. How do I disable? So the next piece of software I'm looking at is called Primo Cash. It's paid. I think they have a special version for Ryzen that's a bit cheaper, but I haven't looked into it that they're doing with AMD just to compete with um, Intel's um, Optane and ReadyBoost and their other caching they've been doing for quite a while now. Um, it seems to work fine. I don't know exactly how it's integrating in it. They have a Windows and a Linux version. They have a server version that supposedly supports more features. I think you can pay more and get support for like bigger cache drives. There's also support for RAM as a cache as well, outside of their normal Windows ones. I don't know how well it integrates with the default Windows solutions because Windows also does RAM caching and stuff as well. Often when you see RAM caching and third party solutions, the one thing you notice is they report much higher speeds because they um, override the standard direct IO system where if you act, ask for it directly from disk, it won't show it won't take into account caching on done by the SysOS, where third-party caching does show up. So now we're booted with Prima Cache installed. It probably installed a kernel driver in it. Um, and here's the GUI program. We have SSD. This is probably what it's designed to do. So let's see if we can set this up easily. So we don't want to cache my C drive. Um, eh, let's cache the whole drive. Those probably won't be used very much. Um, do you want it to be cached next? And now profile it by its target. So I want to do a read and write cache. Um, it should be fine. It will make writes faster. Though the thing with a write cache is you have the risk of data loss if the write cache happens to fail, which you don't have with the read cache, which ReadyBoost was a read cache only. OS manage memory. So you can use a level one cache. We can give it okay. Actually, so just to be fair, we will completely um disable RAM caching here. So to be fair here, we're going to completely disable RAM caching and only use the higher level on um, disk caching just to put it on parity with um, what ReadyBoost is doing as a simple SSD only cache and then we're going to try RAM. The system happens to have 32 gigs of RAM, so we can kind of go to town. We're going to give it max size of the drive, memory overheads 300 megs because you have to have memory to tell it what's in the cache, block size, um, Seems to be pretty much default. So um, we can add volumes, we can edit the cache config here, which is just the page we were at earlier. Uh, manage all two, manage invisible memory, options. We basically, this is pretty boring options, and not much has happened. Now, so if we look in task manager, it should still show the drives. Um, this drive here is really not being hit very hard. And if we look in Explorer to see how it formatted it, uh, screw OneDrive, we can see it just doesn't show up at all, and OneDrive. And it's showing basically a zero hit ratio if I do something like open this. So we're going to do a few reboots now and see how it does with um, a bit more usage. Yeah, so that isn't a great result. We're going to try Crystal Disk Mark now, but... The hit ratio it's claiming is 0.33%, which is pretty darn bad. Might shoot up once we start doing a um, this benchmark here, but oh boy, that's not great. Um, so the original casting solution only using the SSD on this was not great. It seemed to only want to use it as a read cache. 
really wasn't great. So now I've gone a bit more aggressive with it. We're using it as a write cache as well, and we've added the RAM in to have RAM caching. So a lot of this will probably just be RAM caching. As you see, RAM usage has just shot up. If we go into processes memory, it actually doesn't show. It's probably running as a different user or something. And that's RAM caching for you. Then here are the numbers, which is basically running it on a RAM disk because it's completely in RAM. Doesn't seem to be hitting that disk very hard. The the SSD, it's not a great, uh, cache hit ratio is really high, but really it's hitting that level run one RAM cache and really not hitting uh, the SSD very hard. Let's just give it one more reboot and see if it actually fixes the reboot times. I was saying you couldn't put Windows on a 16 gig drive and I did it. Four gigs available with the newest build of Windows 10 with basically I think plain 17 or 9, no updates. Updates will take a chunk. I don't know how big the hibernation file is, but something and sleep file. I don't think it has a hibernation file. I don't think the this, this swap file is going to be tiny if there is one. Probably doesn't want to use it at all. Yeah, so there you go. But just to prove how much better this is, if I reboot it on an SSD, it will boot faster. Now, you probably shouldn't be using this as a boot drive because you install Chrome and realize that uses the four gigs up or you install updates or something like that because Windows likes to grow in size. Of course, they want to go under 120 or realistically 240 gigs these days for a boot drive. But if you need it in a pinch for like a basic server or something, I mean, it would work. And you can already tell by now boot times are a lot faster with an SSD, even this one, which isn't that fast. When we were talking, we were in it, and I don't even need a time lapse to show you the speeds for this SSD. And if I open like Edge, it's just open. SSDs are so much better. So thanks for watching this little look at a cheap M.2 drive. You can see speeds are surprisingly decent, especially with random IO. It's definitely not a high-end SSD, but it's there. Cache, the problem is there's just not many uses for it, and that's why they're cheap. So if you have a use for them, get one. They're great drives. Keep subscribed for more videos about storage or whatever I'm into at that time.